Hill. I am the peer facilitator for the Triple Negative Let's Talk About It group, and I'm so happy to have you all here this evening. Um, we have a, a wonderful presentation on tap for you, and I'm really excited about it. Um, but before the presentation begins, I'd like to just take a moment to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a national nonprofit that supports, educates, and empowers anyone who has been diagnosed with women's cancers and provides outreach to the general public about signs and symptoms. Because no no one should have to face breast, ovarian, uterine, cervical, or metastatic breast cancer alone. For more information, please visit sharecancersupport.org. I'd like to ask that you all stay muted during the presentation, and when our speaker finishes um, presenting, we'll begin the Q&A part of the discussion. You're welcome to submit questions in the chat box, and I'll put a little note in there in a moment just so you know exactly where to put your questions. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Ann Katz is the Certified Sexuality Counselor and Clinical Nurse Specialist at Cancer Care Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. Dr. Katz is the immediate past editor of the Oncology Nursing Forum, the premier research journal of the Oncology Nursing Society. She was inducted into the American Academy of Nursing in 2014, and she's the author of 15 books for healthcare providers and healthcare consumers on the topics of illness and sexuality, as well as cancer survivorship. Her latest book, the second edition of Women, Cancer, Sex, was published in late 2020. And her latest book about sexuality and illness is being published later in 2021. Dr. Katz, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here as always. Um, I always love talking to women, about women, and about sexuality, which is important, uh, even though it can be something <laughs> quite difficult to talk about. So uh, I look forward to your questions uh, and comments, and uh, I'm really focusing today on women with triple negative uh, breast cancer, but I'm aware that there may be people in the audience today that have uh, hormone uh, sensitive breast cancer or other kinds of cancers. So uh, if I don't uh, address those topics specifically, just ask in the chat and uh, Nancy will ask those questions at the end of my presentation. So thank you for inviting me, Nancy. So I tend to really focus in my practice as well as in uh, these kinds of talks on solutions or resolutions to problems. I don't think that there's really much uh, utility in me talking about all the things that can go wrong. Uh, because that's not particularly helpful. You know, you, women are living these things, um, but perhaps may not have been told, thought about, or tried uh, to resolve some of these issues. So these are the five main topics that I'm going to talk about. Uh, these really are, you know, the issues that I see most in my practice uh, in, in women with uh, all kinds of women's cancers. Um, I actually see some of this in men with cancer too, but I'm going to focus on women today. So changes in body image, loss of desire, uh, pain with sexual touch, changes in orgasms, as well as the issue of disclosure for women who are not partnered and want to get back on that horse. So, you know, any kind of cancer that alters anything um, uh, in the body, on the body, um, can really be distressing, disruptive uh, impacts on confidence, uh, both self-confidence, sexual confidence. Um, and, you know, this includes mastectomy, uh, mastectomy with reconstruction. We often think about, you know, women who have reconstruction, uh, reconstruction as having good body image and certainly the research and my clinical experience suggests that this is not so. So, you know, what, what can you do about this? Um, one of the most embarrassing experiences that I had was um, when I saw um, a woman in her early 40s, uh, she was beautifully dressed. Uh, she had on this outfit that looked like it was sort of, you know, from St. John. I don't know if you know that, these sort of knitted uh, outfits. She came to my office and she said to me, I'm really struggling uh, with, with how I look. And I lost my filter for a second and said, but you look great. Whereupon she started to cry. So I now had foot in mouth disease, as well as a huge, huge amount of uh, guilt, and I'm really good at guilt, um, and 
yeah, I just felt absolutely awful. Um, and so I managed to, to stammer and stutter my way out of that by saying, I'm terribly sorry, what do you mean? And she actually lifted up her top, which is not usual for anybody in my office. Um, and I once again lost a filter and I said, oh, you have Barbie breasts. And she cried even harder. This was just, this is really, you know, this is from years and years and years ago. And I still remember it so vividly. I can see her in my mind's eye. Um, and she had reconstruction, bilateral uh, mastectomy and reconstruction. She did not have nipples or areoli, the sort of colored part around the nipple, which is the sticky uppy part, even though we generally talk about the nipple, it's actually the nipple areola complex. Um, her breasts were absolutely perfect, but not the breasts of a 40 something year old, really sort of the breasts of a 20 year old who had not breastfed uh, babies. And when I said Barbie breasts, she actually, you know, cried a little bit and then stopped and she said, yeah, that's exactly it. So, you know, women, really do judge we judge ourselves so harshly and one of the things that that horrible experience taught me is to keep my mouth shut and never tell someone that they look great when they when they they don't feel great and that's what's important so self-compassion is really the most important thing that i would suggest um, when you have changes in body image, whether that's mastectomy, lumpectomy with radiation, um, you know, all of that is going to cause changes in your body image. And self-compassion is really a part of mindfulness. It's really letting go of the guilt and expectations that we and others put on us. And sometimes the others is um, sometimes something that we imagine. So mindfulness is a practice, and I stress the word practice, where uh, you, that really is comprised of um, non-judgmental thoughts and feelings, a huge dose of self-compassion, and has been shown to be really helpful uh, with anxiety uh, and and this often you know is something that that women with with cancer experience. Um, so just, you know, really giving up on those on that judgment that we really do uh, a focus on. Um, there's actually not a lot of research into what can we do about body image. There's a lot of research around assessing body image, you know, talking about what the issues are with changes in, in body issues. Um, the other thing that's really important is coming clean with your partner, telling your partner what is bothering you. So we know that women who've had particularly breast cancer will often start undressing and dressing in the walk-in closet or in the bathroom. And they really do deprive their partner of an elemental sensual experience. For some reason, our partner likes to see us naked. I've never quite figured out why that is, um, but it's important. And um, so, so if you are feeling bad about how your body looks, uh, you are judging yourself way more harshly than your partner likely is. Uh, and, uh, you know, talk about it. Uh, the other thing that I will often suggest to, to my patients, and I'm a nurse by training, so, you know, I have patients, but one of the things that I suggest is that if being naked is uncomfortable for you, don't be naked. Because if you are uncomfortable and all you're thinking about is what your partner is seeing or judging, which they probably aren't, uh, you are not going to be able to relax. And in order to experience pleasure, you have to be relaxed. So if you need to cover up in some way, then do that. So a crisp man's cotton shirt can be really quite sexy. It's comfortable. You can undo and do up buttons as you see fit. Um, people often suggest that, you know, you go to Victoria's Secret or one of those kinds of stores and buy some sort of sexy teddy or peignoir or whatever. I'm never quite sure what a peignoir is. I think it's sort of like a long robe with feathers on it. Um, I find that many of my patients say to me that just draws attention to their body that they don't feel good about. Often there are um, 
you know, darts and seams and underwire and things that are really not comfortable for someone who's had surgery uh, to, to their breast or breasts. Um, so find something comfortable to wear. I would suggest not a ratty cap camp t-shirt from 1972, uh, you know, with moth holes in it, um, but just something that you're comfortable with that feels really good against your skin. But I cannot stress enough the importance of communication, because if you don't tell your partner what you are thinking and feeling, they are probably going to be making stuff up in their head uh, or just not, not aware of, of where you are at. And, you know, we all make assumptions, particularly if you've been in a relationship for longer than five minutes. And I'm convinced that we get assumptions wrong about 90% of the time. My husband gets assumptions wrong 120% of the time, but that's a story for another day. I, of course, am way more sensitive and intuitive about what he is thinking and feeling, and I am never wrong. <clears throat> if I had a dime for every, for in every woman who tells me women who've had cancer, my friends and relatives and acquaintances, and sometimes women in the line at the grocery store, uh, who tell me that they have experienced loss of desire, I would have a lot of quarters, probably not enough to give up my day job, but this is an extremely common experience uh, for women as we age. Uh, if we've experienced illness or any other kind of chronic uh, disease, if we are stressed, um, if we're annoyed with our partner, if we don't like our job, if we are not sleeping properly, loss of desire is really extremely common. And I think part of the problem is because we think of desire in a very male-centric way. So the common thought about desire really is predicated on men who, and I think this is somewhat of a fallacy, uh, you know, have the strong desire all the time from when they are teens all the way to, to old age. And that is actually not true. Uh, men are also sensitive beings, and I certainly see in a lot of my male patients, um, the, they, they lose that desire and, and uh, it's really, really distressing, but it's certainly distressing to women too. So there is no pill or potion for this, and really that's what women want. And oh, if it were so, it would be really easy. There actually are a couple of medications that A, have not ever been tested on women with a history of cancer, um, and B, actually don't work all that well. So some of you may have heard of a medication uh, called um, ADI, uh, the, the trade name is Flabanserin. This is a medication that uh, was tested and is approved by the FDA only for premenopausal women. So that cuts out a whole bunch of us. Um, it has to be taken every night. You cannot drink alcohol at all when you are taking this medication. It is expensive. Um, and you have to take this medication every night. And the, the clinical trials showed an additional one sexually satisfying experience every two months. I don't know what that means for one month, half a satisfying sexual experience, I'm not sure, uh, but it's really not a particularly good drug. It has a really checkered history. Um, and, you know, we don't know if it's safe for women who are postmenopausal naturally or through uh, chemotherapy or surgery or radiation. Um, and we really don't know if it's safe to use uh, in women with any kind of cancer. So there's that one. The other medication that's FDA approved is uh, called, I've forgotten the, the, the trade name, but it's bremelanotide. It's a subcutaneous injection. So it's an injection that you put just under the skin 45 minutes before you want to have sex. And it's supposed to increase your desire. Now I want you to think about that. If you don't have desire, how likely are you to have to put a needle somewhere in your body, inject something in order to feel desire for sex? So, uh, you know, I would suggest that that's a major failure too. Once again, also not tested in women with cancer. 
What we do know, and this is going to be on the right of your screen, what we do know is that for most women, desire or libido is reactive rather than spontaneous. So the diagram that you see on your screen is um, a model um, developed and tested by Dr. Rosemary Basson, who's a Canadian from British Columbia. She's a physician. And the, the long and the short of this model is that for most women, once something happens, right? Once you perhaps start kissing and canoodling with your partner, and there is some degree of arousal, that is often when women start to experience reactive desire. The model also talks about that women have multiple reasons to be sexual with their partner, and that that gives the woman non-sexual rewards. So, you know, really what I want you to think about here is really the difference between spontaneous desire, which is when you walk around like thinking about sex all day, maybe, maybe not, uh, that is spontaneous desire. And that really is lacking in a lot of, of, for a lot of women, because we've got a whole bunch of stuff to think about and do during the day. Whereas that reactive desire is perhaps when you're sitting next to your partner watching television and your outer thigh touches him or her. And that is when you perhaps start thinking about eh, maybe, maybe this afternoon, this morning, tonight, I would consider getting something together. So that is loss of desire. You know, no pills, no potions, I'm sorry. Pain with sexual touch is extremely common in women post-menopause. Surgical menopause, so when your ovaries have been removed surgically. Chemical menopause, where your ovaries shut down because of chemotherapy and chemotherapy attacks rapidly dividing cells, cancer cells and the ovaries, where, which rapidly divide uh, constantly in the production of an egg. Um, and then, of course, natural menopause for some women, where the ovaries really do sort of go into to not even hibernation. They kind of shut down and are not producing estrogen. Uh, and estrogen is the hormone of lubrication or arousal. So in the absence of estrogen, women experience pain with sexual touch as well as penetration. This is even worse in women who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer, so who are taking tamoxifen if they are premenopausal at the time of treatment, or one of the aromatase inhibitors like letrozole, anastrozole, et cetera, um, if they are postmenopausal at the time of treatment. They work in slightly different ways, but basically they shut down or, or make the body um, not responsive to any kind of estrogen. So this causes pain with sexual touch. Women will often tell me that it stings a little bit when they pass urine, that, that their external genitalia, the vulva, uh, is really, really sensitive, sometimes burning and stinging, just when they're going about their daily activities, when they dry themselves after, um, after urinating, um, just really burning and stinging. So, you know, what can you do about this? This can make sex unbearably painful. And very often what will happen is that you then get involvement of the pelvic floor muscles, which are there to protect you. So anything that hurts the uh, external genitalia, the vulva, or the entrance to the vagina is going to cause those muscles to tense up to protect you from the incoming object, whatever that is. Um, and that then can lead to issues with passing urine, issues with, with bowel movements. So often women with a very tight pelvic floor will experience a lot of constipation. So what are some of the things that we can do about that? Moisturizers for daily comfort. And there are a number of moisturizers that are available over the counter. <clears throat> the one that is probably the most well-known is Replens. Uh, which is a gel that is inserted into the vagina um, with an applicator, almost like one of those sort of tampon applicators. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of, of uh, replens. It tends to be really, really goopy. And women tell me that they just feel wet all the time and they really don't like it. Um, a better moisturizer 
for, for the vagina is a product called Repagan, R-E-P-A hyphen G-Y-N, which is a powerful moisturizer called hyaluronic acid. I know women often kind of say, acid, I'm not putting that anywhere near me. This does not burn or sting. Um, any decent facial moisturizer will have hyaluronic acid. You've probably seen commercials for this in magazines and on television. Um, hyaluronic acid is a very, very powerful moisturizer. The moisturizers are different from lubricants. So moisturizers really are for daily comfort. If you are experiencing dryness on the outside, um, these products uh, that is something that is designed to be used internally is really not going to help um, externally. Vitamin E oil is a really nice um, pharmaceutical grade oil that can be placed externally. If you want to use coconut oil, and I know a lot of women use coconut oil, that's okay on the outside. You should not put coconut oil or any other oil for that matter, olive oil or um, shea butter or you know Vaseline uh, on the outside. So vitamin E oil. Lubricants are for love making. That's the only time you hear me say love making because sometimes sex is really not about love. Um, so lubricants, they are essentially um, water-based and silicone-based lubricants. Uh, water-based lubricants are your entry-level lubricant. Um, important to check the, the box that it comes in or the bottle or tube that it comes in. If it's got a long list of ingredients, I would suggest caution. Um, silicone-based lubricants, which are a little bit more expensive, tend to be very, well, they're very, very slippery. So a little goes a long way. Uh, be very careful if there's any spillage on the bathroom floor, because if someone steps on it, you're going to have a broken hip and sex is, is probably off the table for a good three months. Um, so lubricants, including for sexual touch. So generally, if you are um, having any kind of sexual activity with a male partner, you put the lubricant on his penis before insertion. Uh, you sh really shouldn't be putting lubricant inside the vagina yourself because it tends not to work that well, but you can certainly put some lubricant on the external genitalia, which really cushions any kind of sexual touch. So for example, cl clitoral stimulation, um, if, if that tissue is dry, it's going to hurt, right? Friction is going to be bad. So put some lubricant there. Certainly, uh, not everybody wants penetration or is able to have penetration. So one of the things that, that I talk about a lot with my patients is outer course, which we used to teach teens way, way back in the 1980s and 1990s when we talked about SDI and HIV prevention. So outer course involves the woman lubricating her inner thighs close to her vulva, and if she's once again, uh, having sex with a man, the man puts his erect penis between her thighs. This allows for direct clitoral stimulation. And frankly, men often can't tell the difference. Uh, that needs to be our little secret for tonight. Um, so out of course, uh, many moons ago, I saw a, a couple, they were in their 70s and um, she had endometrial cancer. And she'd had radiation and um, internal and external radiation, and uh, she could not tolerate any kind of penetration. So I talked to them about out of course, and this might have been the first couple that I'd ever suggested this to. And I was not sure how this was going to be received. So I talked about it and they listened attentively to me and then pretty much got up and left my office. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, did I insult them in some way? They didn't seem annoyed. And literally two hours later, I got a phone call from them to say that it worked perfectly and they were just so grateful. So, you know, um, if this is a problem, you know, give it a whirl. Certainly talk to your partner. Um, if, if, if penetration or sexual touch is painful for you, your partner is going to know. I promise you, they are going to know uh, because you are probably holding your breath. You're probably clenching your jaw. Uh, you might be biting your lip, uh, your whole body is going to be tense, they know, and this can often cause sexual problems in your partner as well, because generally, you know, we don't like hurting our partner when doing, you know, something like this. The other thing for women with triple negative breast cancer, you can use local estrogen. This is really, really important information for you. 
women with ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, if your cancer is not hormone sensitive or dependent on hormones, you can use local estrogen. And this really gets to the root cause of the problem. Uh, local estrogen is available in cream form or uh, little tablets that are inserted into the vagina. This is called Vagifem or Imvexi, I-M-V-E-X-X-Y. Uh, the Imvexi is actually cheaper than, than Vagifem. Don't ask me why. Um, and uh, this really gets to the root cause and will really regenerate uh, the vaginal tissues and actually will also have an effect on the vulva as well. So, you know, lots of women with uh, hormone sensitive breast cancer are told that they can never, ever, ever use any kind of um, estrogen estrogen product that is actually not true for even for women with hormone sensitive uh, cancers but this you know is very very controversial you know discuss this with your gynecologist with your oncologist uh, it really can be a life changer changes in orgasm often linked to pain also perhaps linked to um, loss of desire also perhaps linked to body image issues so you know women may experience um, no orgasms, altered orgasms, uh, orgasms that are more painful if that pelvic floor is really tight because of, of pain with sexual touch or penetration, um, or just because your head's somewhere else. You know, we know that a women lie about orgasms all the time. We also know that women don't have to be or don't have to have orgasms to be sexually satisfied. Um, and you know, there are so many books about orgasm. Um, you know, just look on on Google or uh, Amazon, and you'll be amazed because this seems to be the holy grail. Um, certainly, mindfulness can be helpful for this. Um, really important to make sure that you're adequately aroused. Uh, and often what happens is particularly when um, sex is painful or penetration is painful uh, or, or just um, you know, not pleasant anymore, women will often rush because they just want to get this over and done with. Um, and this is not a great idea because uh, if you are not adequately aroused, you're certainly going to be lacking in your natural lubrication um, and, uh, and orgasms are going to be not there. Um, I recommend vibrators for men and women. You know, the experience of cancer and cancer treatments um, can really change your body, your body's response. Uh, you know, we know, for example, that women who've had a hysterectomy, uh, the, the nerves, um, that are partly responsible uh, for orgasms are damaged or very often destroyed. So there may be a, a physiological anatomical reason for loss of orgasms. And after cancer, you have to relearn what your body likes and what feels good for your body. And a vibrator is a really, really good idea. I'm often amazed at how many women tell me that, um, you know, oh yeah, I have a vibrator, but I haven't used it for like 10 years. My suggestion then is buy a new one because, you know, if it was battery operated, the batteries probably have corroded um, and you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't use it anyway. And, and vibrators really have come a long way. Um, you don't need to go to a sex store to buy a vibrator. Um, they are available on Amazon. Um, one of the companies that, that I really, really like because their uh, vibrators, uh, you know, don't look like a great old penis. Um, the, the, the company is called Lelo, L-E-L-O.com. They have really beautiful products. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, they come in discreet packaging to your home. Um, some of them are a little bit expensive, but certainly the sort of the entry level ones uh, really start sort of round about a hundred dollars uh, and you charge most of them with a USB port. So that's really great. And they tend to be quite silent as well. So your kids won't, won't hear you experimenting. Um, and certainly pelvic floor physiotherapy can be really, really helpful because a lot of the sensation of orgasm actually comes from the muscles of the pelvic floor contracting. So an orgasm actually happens because the messages from that part of your body go up to the brain saying that feels really, really good. And then the brain sends, sends messages to the pelvic floor, which contracts. And, you know, 
the, the mystical, mythical orgasm is just that. It's a series of muscle contractions. Um, so if you have a really tight pelvic floor, orgasms can be really painful. If you have a loose pelvic floor, which unfortunately many women have because of carrying pregnancies, going through labor and delivery, often this will affect the muscles of the pelvic floor. Um, and certainly post-menopause uh, also, there are, there are structural changes uh, in the pelvis because of loss of estrogen. Estrogen contributes to collagen, right? And collagen is what keeps tissues where they ought to be uh, and keeps that sort of tissue architecture. That's why we get wrinkles as we get older through and post-menopause, women get wrinkles because of loss of estrogen. Um, so a pelvic floor physiotherapist can be really, really helpful in addressing a loose pelvic floor. Uh, women who have incontinence when so bladder leakage, when they cough, laugh, sneeze, that's a function of the pelvic floor, um, which keeps the bladder closed. So if your pelvic floor is loose, you cough, laugh, or sneeze, and you know I know many of you are experiencing this, uh, you get an involuntary loss of incontinence, which you know is its own whole host of, of issues. If your pelvic floor is very tight, uh, you will also, uh, you will experience perhaps constipation, as I mentioned before, and painful orgasms, which are not that much fun. I want to talk a little bit about the whole issue of disclosure of a, a cancer treatment for cancer. And this is a huge issue for women who are not partnered, uh, either out of choice, um, because they're young. And we also know that uh, younger women tend to have triple negative breast cancer or because you are, you know, recently or perhaps distantly unpartnered and you want to, to reestablish um, a relationship. And this is a huge, huge issue. It, I hear this all the time from men and women or women and men, um, you know, how do I, how do I tell someone that I've had cancer? How do I tell someone that I have a missing body part? How do I tell someone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I wish I had a really good evidence-based answer. What I can tell you that I have learned from a variety of people, young and old, is that you have to tell at some point. A young woman who had lymphoma told me that she tells on the second date not the first, not the third or fourth, she tells on the second date. And I asked her why. And she said, well, you know, the first date, whether it's online, and certainly over the last two years, that's been happening a lot with COVID, uh, or, you know, going out for coffee at an independent coffee shop, as opposed to a corporate coffee shop. Um, that first date, that first coffee date, or, you know, whatever, walk in the park, whatever it is, it just seems really, really early. Um, if you don't see the other person again, uh, most people will think that it's because they've had cancer that, that the other person disappeared. It's often not that, right? But you will blame the cancer because that's an easy thing to blame. So she said the first date is too early. The third date she felt was too late because already there's some connection if you're going on a third date. So she settled for the second date. She said, I'm not emotionally invested at that point. Um, so if I never see the other person again, it's okay. The third, fourth, fifth date really feels dishonest, like I've been hiding something. So that was her suggestion. Um, I think online dating affords some distance, which gives you some protection. Um, certainly you've got to be a little bit careful about online dating because people are often not what they present themselves as. Uh, and certainly, you know, all the issues, if you're going to meet the person uh, in person, all the safety issues, telling someone where you're going, telling them what time you expect to be home, et cetera, et cetera, apply. Uh, certainly, you know, give yourself some time. If you're freshly out of a relationship, you're freshly out of treatment, you may not be whole. You may still be dealing with all those issues, um, and it might just be just too early to do that. You know, and certainly, you know, forgiveness for yourself and for somebody perhaps that you've met online or you've been introduced to by a friend or a relative. If it doesn't work out, that person was not meant for you. And it's really important not to settle. Um, 
if you are a little bit older, you know, and have some life experience under your belt, the person that you or the people that you might be interested in are probably around about the same age or a little bit older than you and have their own baggage, right? Nobody is perfect. Um, we all bring with us our life experience and, and that includes, you know, chronic conditions, diabetes, um, heart disease, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's scary and, you know, I know that it's scary, but, uh, you know, it's, it can certainly be worthwhile if that's what you want. <clears throat> so that is the end of my formal presentation. I finished a, a wee bit early, my apologies, Nancy. I, uh, I hope there are lots of questions and we can get some discussion going. So I am ready for your questions. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and please feel free to put questions in the chat. I've gotten a couple um, sent as private chats. So I will